Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Betsy Fisher Martin, the Executive Director of the Women in Politics Institute at American University. And welcome to our special post-debate post Thursday edition of our virtual series, Women on Wednesdays. Uh, to those of you new to one of our events, WPI is a nonprofit and nonpartisan institute in AU School of Public Affairs that aims to close the gender gap in political leadership. And we offer academic and practical campaign training and we facilitate research and discussions like this one on women in politics. So tonight we're excited to have with us an all-star panel of women to discuss the many different aspects of the historic VP debate last night between Kamala Harris and Mike Pence. Uh, Candy Crowley, who you recognize, now happily retired from a long and successful <laughs> career in television news. She was, of course, the chief political correspondent for CNN, as well as the host of their Sunday show, State of the Union. And in 2012, she moderated the town hall debate between Obama and Romney. So we will talk to her about that. Uh, Casey Hunt uh, is with us, and she has covered Kamala Harris for several years in the Senate uh, from her spot as the Capitol Hill correspondent for NBC News. And she hosted a weekly show on MSNBC that I loved called Casey DC, but now she has <laughs> taken over as the anchor for the aptly named Way Too Early show, <laughs> which leads into Morning Joe in the morning at the ungodly hour of 5 a.m. Oh, so Casey, I this is probably your <laughs> time right now. So also helping us out and putting everything in political context is Karen Finney, who is a Democratic strategist and MSNBC analyst. Uh, she has more than 20 years experience CNN. working in the national, oh, CNN now, excuse me. <laughs> you change, should be on MSNBC weekly. <laughs> <laughs> she has more than 20 years uh, in national politics, including four presidential campaigns, the Clinton White House, and of course, serving as a communications director for the DNC. So thank you all for being here. Really appreciate it. Before we start, I want everybody to know that we are going to save some time for questions. So on the bottom of your screen, you will see an ask the question button. So please uh, send in your questions during the course of our conversation. And you can also upvote other people's questions that you may be interested in as well. And if you miss any of our discussion or want to share it with friends, uh, there'll be a full replay available right after we wrap up. And it's, it'll be at the same link that you use to register. So with that, Candy, Casey, and Karen, Welcome. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. Of course. So, Casey, let me start with you. Um, as I mentioned, you have covered Senator Harris on the Hill for many, many years. Uh, how do you think she did last night in front of really what had to be the biggest audience of her career? Yeah, it really was the, the biggest stage for her. And yeah. I, I think for, for those of us who have watched her, and, and forgive me if you hear banging in the background, my son is awake. Um, <laughs> I'm on a little piano, so I apologize <laughs> like the age of COVID. Um, but uh, so I think, you know, there was a big question about whether she was going to and how she was potentially going to rise to the occasion, because we have seen, uh, she has had really a meteoric rise in politics. She has uh, taken a very uh, methodical uh, path to where she is now. She, uh, when you get to know her a little bit behind the scenes, you realize, you know, she very much knows where she wants to go. She has a plan for how to get there. And uh, she has applied that every step along the way. And I've sort of been there and, and been lucky enough to, be uh, be able to kind of observe observe how she did that when she first came to Washington as a senator. She you know spent time courting the national media and was very careful initially in the hallways, for example, about mm -hmm. uh, figuring out getting her feet under her in terms of how to talk to the press. And I think you saw that in her presidential campaign as well. And she had a lot of very strong moments, and she had some missteps. She would have planned debate stage moments. And then sometimes the next day, she would struggle to explain her policy position. Medicare for all is one example of this. Mm -hmm. So I think there was a question, uh, you know, for her was uh, on this stage, was she going to be nervous? Was she going to be thrown off at all? Or was she going to be able to deliver at a level that we know she's able to? And I think certainly the sense from the people that I've talked to, Democrats on Capitol Hill and people in the Biden campaign in the last day is that they feel like she really rose to the challenge and that she did very well. And, uh, you know, as as Karen and, and Betsy and, and Candy all know more than more than anyone else, women are judged differently than men on stages like this. And yeah. so the way that she dealt with the interruptions from Mike Pence, I think, was 
uh, in many ways, a, a new and different approach than we've seen in the past from women. She pushed back against him. She didn't hesitate from that. She did it with a smile. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, perhaps we will get to a point where you know we're not, or voters are not looking at a demeanor like that and saying, "Well, you have to be nice when you tell somebody not to interrupt me." But uh, you know, I, I, I think it's clear, uh, certainly from my reporting, that they thought a lot about that and that she yeah. executed well. Yeah, I mean, I thought in many ways too. She, yeah, she stuck up for herself, and she, you know, when she wasn't getting equal time, uh, she said it, and she sort of, you know, demanded that she have equal time. And at the end of the day. Every, they, they did the math on the timing and both of them had just about the same amount of, of speaking time uh, in the debate. Karen, let me ask you, how do you think she's feeling today and sort of what are the reactions inside the campaign? I know you're close with a lot of folks that work on the campaign yeah. and what are you hearing from sort of inside there? I think she's feeling really good, uh, yeah. obviously relieved. <laughs> One of the things that people forget, right? If you're the, when you are the VP challenger, you have to know four people's records, right? You have to know right. yours, the, you know, she had to know Pence and Trump and um, Biden and actually the Obama Biden record, because, you know, there was an expectation and we saw it come that some of the attacks would actually be about the Obama Biden record. So a yeah. lot of studying and hard work. And, and as Casey said, a lot of thinking about the optics and the dynamics of this historic moment as a black woman, as an Indian American, uh, Asian American woman on this stage. And look, the reality for women is we don't, we have to navigate these spaces very differently and thread these needles very differently. And as a black woman, she yeah. was very aware not to be the angry black woman. And so as Casey mm -hmm. pointed out, you do it with a smile, <laughs> you do it with a, you know, and, and, and really trying to figure out. And look, I think there were moments that she strategically kind of let it go because again, you have to be mindful that do you, how much of your time do you want to spend correcting and stopping versus, uh, you know, just saying, all right, I'm just going to go to my next point and I'm going to let this one go. And so I think in right. terms of that part of the plan, she executed it beautifully. You know, I think she also proved herself that she is more than capable of stepping into the job of president, if that uh, should be the case. And most importantly, I think, you know, she was able to do something that unfortunately, you know, was not possible in the train wreck of last week that, right. that if you want to call it a debate, we can call it that there actually was an opportunity to, to get to talk some substance and to talk some policy. And I thought the most effective thing, frankly, and they felt good about this. I mean, bad for the country, good in terms of pressing the point, COVID. I mean, it was front and center in the debate. You know, it was those that plexiglass, frankly, was another character. That and the fly, right, right were two other yeah. characters <laughs> that were really part of the debate. And it was unmistakable. And I think she um, did a good job of pressing that point and really had some good moments. I think she felt good about speaking directly to the camera and trying to talk directly to the American people which is very hard to do. You know, when you prep people for that, you you practice it, it doesn't always come off well. And I think she actually did it quite well. So they're feeling good. The campaign is feeling good. Obviously not taking anything for granted with three weeks to go. Right, but she did what she had to do. Yes, 100%. She yeah, did exactly, yeah. and she did what she needed to do. And, yeah. and folks feel really good about that. Yeah, so Candy, you probably like me, like the former journalist and me just, at some point, wanted just to reach through the TV screen and say, answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> now, fully expecting they wouldn't. So I mean, yeah. you know, who's surprised here? I mean, it's um, it's it's nice when you have as much time as you could possibly want because you can sit there in the chair and going, but that really wasn't my question. But that really wasn't my question. I mean, I right. think, look, she did, she did answer some questions. But on the other hand, she had less to defend than he did. He had a right. heck of a lot to defend. So obviously he's he's off wanting to talk about the things he wanted to talk about. She she had really one mission, and that's to say to the nation, I could be president if that should become necessary. That's right. I, I mean, that's her mission last night. Uh, I, I, she may have said all those things with a smile. I'm not sure she felt them with a smile. And I think that was uh, right. also- We don't uh, always. I think, <laughs> I, think, I think women understood that. Um, yeah. And I, I think if you followed a lot of the commentary, um, that was, uh, it was evident to a lot of people that the, the smile mask, the come on. And it was clearly how they had decided she was going to react. Right. right. When yeah, she right. was interrupted, they clearly had right. said, okay, here's what you do. You say, I'm, I'm speaking. 
I yeah. did wonder if, if the situation were reversed, and I honestly don't have an answer to this, but if the situation were reversed and she had interrupted him and he had turned to her and said, I'm sorry, I'm speaking, how that would have come across. <laughs> I, I mean, yeah. I, I think it would have come across as condescending, whereas with her saying it, it was like, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm speaking here, right? right? And so it was, you know, so that it can cut both ways. Yeah. Um, and so I, th I thought they handily took care of that. She kept it on coronavirus and she said, yeah, I can walk and chew gum and I know the issues and I can step in if this man who will be 78 years old in January, should he become president, um, I'm a, I am a worthy second. So talk to us a little bit, Candy, too, about the role of the moderator, you having lived through this yeah. um, and like the frustration that we all had on, you know, the not able to follow up. And I think some people were criticizing Susan Page, um, our colleague from USA Today, for not doing sort of those follow ups. Right. But as you and I both know from our experience with the commission, there's a very set strict set of rules and she may not have been able to kind of take that to the next level. And, right. and by the by, the, yeah. the commission talks to both campaigns, both campaigns, you know, go back and say, no, I, I need the podium to be higher. I want, right. you know, a fan. I need three minutes. No, <laughs> I want four. So this is, and Karen can tell you, this goes on, yes. oh, yeah. you know, forever, <laughs> right? So by the time you get it, like every second is spoken for, because the, what the commission wants is these two people on the stage. Okay. Yes. So they, yeah. you know, they say, here's what they've agreed to. And Everybody, whoever does that, knows that they're not going to, that, that's not going to last, right? They were, of course, they're not going to do it. They're going to say, eat what time you can, eat what time you can, get this message out, keep saying it. That's exactly what they all go to do, whether the Democrat yeah. or the Republican. If you're the moderator, you know, first of all, it depends on your definition. Like a lot of people yes. think you are a potted plant. Yeah. And you ought to go, your turn, your turn, your turn. The problem is if you take someone um, like Chris Wallace, or like Tim, yeah. or Tom Brokaw, or uh, Susan Page, all of whom are reporters, it is against everything in you not to go, wait, that was not the question. Yes. Was this, <laughs> right? So yeah. um, you're constantly sort of seeking that balance because you can hear people throwing shoes at the screen. Yeah. I, there's no <laughs> doubt about it because yeah. you want to yeah. throw shoes yourself uh, and not in that good way. Um, <laughs> so, not the good trouble. Yeah, 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 that's not good trouble. That's bad trouble. So you know, you're in a, a, a darned if you do and darned if you don't. Yeah. But I, I, you know, it is, it is so organic. The the, the those you can say I'm going to go and here's here's the kind of moderator I'm going to be and you get there, and it is just as it rolls. It's not yeah. what you think it's going to be. Um, and you, you know, I mean, it's like I was listening to Chris at one point. He said, well, I thought it was going pretty well. And then I realized, you know, 45 minutes in, oh, my gosh, the strategy here is blah, blah, blah. I'm sure Susan, you know, she goes in there having seen the one before thinking I'm going to, you know, these guys Keep are the time and, and, yeah. and I'm going to say thank you, Mr. President, but thank, uh, Vice President, Mr. Vice President. And then it just becomes like, you know, fingernails on a chalkboard. Right. Because, you know, he's going to go over it. So there's no. There's no set way to do it. And and whatever your plan is going in, it's going to get disrupted by the disruptors. Yeah. And, and there's always stuff. And guess what? Yeah. Susan is a is a grown woman yeah. and an incredible reporter as Chris is, and she's just fine. So yeah. Yeah. you know. I wanna I wanna play a little snippet for um your from your moderating because you got in the middle of sort of the fact check debate, which I think is another <laughs> fascinating conversation. But I want to play a little bit of it because this is going to make all of us sad, but I, we probably have some students in the audience who were like 10 or 12. Or not born. I, mean, <laughs> I was going to say are not born. <laughs> when yeah. this debate happened in 2012. So let me just play a little snippet so folks can see exactly what happened. And um, you can explain a little bit of it here. Um, let's see. I, I think it's interesting the president just said something which which is that on the day after the attack he went to the Rose Garden and said that this was an act of terror. Whoops. You said in the Rose Garden the day after the attack it was an act of terror. 
It was not a spontaneous demonstration. Is that what you're saying? Please proceed, Governor. I, I want to make sure we get that for the record because it took the president 14 days before he called the attack in Benghazi an act of terror. Get the transcript. It, 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 he did, in, in fact, sir. So let me let me call it an act of terror. Did you say that a little louder, Danny? <laughs> he did call it an act of terror. <laughs> it did as well take it did as well uh, take uh, two weeks or so uh, for the whole idea of there being a riot out there about this tape to come out. You're correct this, about that. The administration. The administration indicated that this was a a reaction to a to a video and was a spontaneous reaction. It, it took them a long time to say this was a terrorist act by a terrorist group. <laughs> so you got stuck in the middle of um, you yes, know. Yes, he did. No, he didn't. Yes, he did. No, he didn't. Yeah, yeah. And I, like you said, you were the journalist in you is. You know, you know, what's funny is it was the moderator in me thinking, let's not get stuck on this axle here because, yeah. we've, again, we've got all these people waiting to ask questions and they're going, you did, you didn't, you did, you didn't. He said this, right. no, he didn't. And I wanted to kind of move it along. So I wasn't thinking time to fact check. I was just thinking, let's, can we move on here? So, you know, look, I think the fact checking is, um, and I've said this a thousand times, it is a slippery slope. Because mm -hmm. guess what? You can't know every fact that comes up in a debate. You just can't. And right. so if you do fact check, then you're going to be criticized for what you did in fact check. Well, she fact checked him on this, but she didn't fact check her on that. And she did, and then they'll add up who you fact checked and who you didn't and blah, 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 blah. If yeah. you don't fact check, um, and by the way, four years ago, there was a lot of fact checking that went on. I don't know if you noticed that, but I mean, it, practically every debate had people fact checking Trump in real time. So, you you know, you're, you're kind of stuck. And as a reporter, you right, there's a part of you that goes, you know, well, that's not true, but this is. So, you know, it's, it's just, again, that was an organic, you know, moment. Yeah. And I reacted to the moment and, you know, then we moved on. So it's it's just not as, first of all, easy as it seems, um, nor does it ever go the way anybody thinks it's going to go. Um, right. And and I do think the time limits and things like that make it really difficult to get to any point for the, which I think is actually what the candidates want. Um, <laughs> right. But it, it also just makes it difficult to hone in on something. Yes, for sure. For sure. Um, I had Martha Raditz um, come and speak to one of my classes this year about this topic, too. And she said, you know, for the moderator, it's like prepping and taking the SATs in front of 84 million people. Right. <laughs> you know, right. super yeah. hard, super hard to do. Um, Karen, let me ask you, though, until that, that notion of fact checking, there was mm -hmm. leading up to the debate, um, some reporting about um, the prep inside the Harris, you know, uh, campaign yeah. saying that he was likely going to skip the fact checking on Pence because voters, you know, seem to punish women who come across as too negative. Yes. Do you think that was like a deliberate decision that they just were going to let some of that stuff go? Yeah, well, there's a couple parts to it, right? Yeah. Number one, you know, so it's interesting listening to Candy talk about yeah. how the moderator preps, you know, when you're yeah. prepping someone for a debate, I mean, part of where you start with the premise is you have X amount of speaking time and you've got to make the most of that time. And then you decide what are the key points we know you have to make in the, in the you know, you're likely going to get this number of minutes by the time your first opponent answers and the questions asked, right? It's, yeah. so it's, um, and obviously in this one, she had a lot more time to talk than she did in some of the primary debates in the Democratic primary when there's 10 people on stage. So part of one calculation is how much of your time do you want to spend fact checking when that's time you're not putting talking about here's our criminal justice plan that does boom, boom, boom. Right. Uh, right. So that's one calculation. The other calculation. And again, this goes to what we were talking about before, the sort of doing it with a smile and sort of in, in some instances, letting some things go. Women are judged, as I mentioned, on likability. Right. Our trustworthiness on likability. We are also, you know, we constantly have to credential ourselves. That's part of why she, we, assume, you know, when men in our race, we assume that they're qualified. Women have to talk about their qualifications. It's one of the reasons in 2016 we kept saying Hillary Clinton would have been the most qualified person we'd ever had as president because of her qualifications. So, right. but part of it is you have to 
under, you know, so part one of the dynamics you're having to think about is, okay, likability means I've got to be warm and engaging and bring people in, but I've also got to be tough and I've got to be firm and I've got to pick my spots and decide, you know, again, that negativity, if you, if you, you don't want to come off as sort of carping, like, well, he's not telling the truth. He's not telling the truth. And sort of, mm -hmm. and again, to what you said, so I think there was some decisions made about how to both handle misinformation or disinformation and sort of, you know, you tend to make some agreements around certain completely outrageous, egregious, like if you would have brought up Burisma, for example, I think you would have seen a much firmer, hold on, that's not right. You have, that's when you have to go in. So you have to make right. those kinds of decisions. And then some decisions about, well, there are places where we'll let it go because the fact checkers will do their job. And my job is to, you know, use the time to press our case about what we're going to do. Um, and at the yeah. same time, you know, again, I have to keep coming back to this. The racial dynamic in this is also very important. As a black woman, we don't get to have the same range of emotions, frankly, publicly. It sucks, but it's true um, that white women do. And so right. there is a, you know, we are aware of that. There is a reality to that and how we express ourselves around that. Um, it is all part of, you know, how you think about how people are going to perceive the information. And frankly, you want to make sure that as the messenger, the, your attributes are not getting in the way of the channel of communicating your message. And so that right. all of those things go into yeah. that. Like she, there was one point in the debate too, where, you know, Pence had that sort of low blow about plagiarism. Right. And uh, she just, she sort of let that go. I think she made a face or something. Right. It's just not right. worth it. It's, right. And it goes to also to something. I mean, I thought, for example, the, there was an exchange around fracking that was starting to get yeah. so in the weeds that I just thought, Oh God, make it stop. <laughs> because most <laughs> people right now do not care about fracking. They care yeah, about yeah, COVID yeah, yeah. and the economy. And he, you know, they were sort of pressing the point. I thought, oh my gosh, if we get into, you know, this too far deep into this, you're gonna lose people. Right. Um, but so yeah, that's the other reason, right? Is it's like in some instances, trying to fact check is gonna take you down a rabbit hole that's just not even worth it. Yeah. Casey, let me um let me ask you about sort of covering Kamala Harris during the primaries and what we saw in those debates. Um, and of course she was criticized and it potentially hurt her campaign when she went after Biden in the primary debates. Did you think that it her performance was much different and that maybe she, there was some things she learned along the way there? Well, my sense is that the performance aspect of it actually was a big success in that yeah. she set up you know, she thought about what she was going to do and she really did execute. The yeah. risk, of course, was that there are all of these personal dynamics between her and former Vice President Biden. And it really did seem to put her selection as the vice presidential nominee into jeopardy. But the fact that ultimately they gave her the slot says that, you know, perhaps to me anyway, that that, that was worth the risk. And, you know, there was a lot of, uh, you know, reporting during the selection process that kind of focused on, well, there were some people in Biden's camp who thought that this was an unfair hit and that it meant that she couldn't be loyal to him and all of these things. And then there were questions about that uh, from Kamala Harris's camp and from others, particularly women, who said, would you really be saying that about a male candidate who landed a good hit on, on your guy? I mean, it, it's not as though Barack Obama and Joe Biden didn't go at it in the primary back in 2008 and ultimately... Uh, you know, Obama selected uh, Biden as his right. former, uh, vice president. So, you know, I, I do think she may have learned some lessons about uh, how you fight with your friends, uh, which is what a democratic debate is. It's it's much different than a one-on-one -on -one in a general election uh, setting. And I think they certainly, uh, you know, she obviously, did, she didn't win the nomination, so she made some mistakes in her presidential campaign. I think they know that. I think mm -hmm. there was a surprise that she didn't actually last longer in the campaign considering um, all of the, the the hype, frankly, and excitement about her candidacy uh, from the outset. And she hired a lot of good people. Uh, there were there were quite a, you know there was a lot of investment in her. And you know I think the people that did work for her came out of it feeling like uh, you know she has the potential to go all the way potentially, but she wasn't ready at that point. And I think you know anyone who's run for president will tell you you think you might know what it's like. You might think you want to do it. And you do it and <laughs> There's just nothing to compare it to. And, and even right. those of us who have seen a million campaigns, or not a million, but you know, several campaigns, Candy has, has covered uh, many, many of them, uh, as have you, Betsy. 
I mean, you just, until you're the candidate, you just have no idea what it's like to be in that space. And so from that perspective, it never hurts to get the experience of running because at least she went through that crucible of the primary that she can now apply in, in this. And I think you saw that come out on the stage last night. Yeah, um, Candy, let me ask you, because there was um, a, a funny discussion on, on Twitter about um, after the um, Trump-Biden debate, how, you know, in 2016, speaking of Hillary Clinton, you know, she must have certainly been itching to tell Trump to <laughs> shut up, man. And then she, Hillary Clinton replied on the tweet and said, you have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so, yeah. you know, looking back at that race, you know, those gender dynamics at play where Biden can get away with saying shut up, man. But had Hillary been the one to say it would have been a totally different game. It would have it, for several reasons. Yes. The primary one being, you know, she's female. That yeah. comes across as harsh and all of that. But also because Trump wasn't as um, well known in terms of his personality and what he's going to do and what he might say or do about a pandemic or, yeah. you know, whatever. So, I mean, it, it, you know, I think the circumstance of it, I mean, even... I I thought the clown thing and the shut up thing were kind of mistakes, but the, the truth <clears> is, <throat> I, I really feel like Joe Biden would have to fall down and, uh, you know, have some sort of catastrophic thing happen for this to not, I mean, in which he didn't in his debate, she certainly didn't in her debate. Th this is about him. Mm -hmm. This is about Donald Trump. And so the vice presidential debate went you know, and it was interesting and it was all those things, but it's still about President Trump. And in the end, I don't, I'm not sure that the debates, and I'm not sure there's really a historic reason to believe that the debates move things uh, one way or the other. And I think that remains true looking at yeah. this. It's interesting because while it may not move things, um, CNN did one of their after polls and we saw this, you know, gender gap in how people perceived who the winner was, where right. women last night saw Kamala Harris as the winner. I think it was like 70 to 30 and men was more evenly split, like 48, 46 um, yeah. in terms of how they actually who they actually thought <laughs> won the debate. Right. Yeah. I yeah. think it'll be interesting to see. I, I would to save those numbers. And this is a flash poll. Yes. You know, flash of course. Polls have yeah. Their, yes. Their drawbacks. But yeah. it'll be interesting to see. Like right now, the male vote, as far as I recall, is pretty split as it is. Um, when overall male vote, obviously, yes. with yes. Uh, African Americans and, and with um, people Latina background, it's more on the um, Biden side. But in general, men overall, I think there's maybe a one or two point difference with women. It's like some crazy differential at this yeah. point. And I wouldn't be surprised if what you're seeing in that flash poll isn't reflected in the poll polls. Right. Um, well, because people have their team you're looking on. at people yeah. who but, people who are watching generally have made up their mind. I don't think they're looking at the debates thinking, hmm, which one of these people am I going to? I think they're looking to watch, to cheer their guy on or their yeah. woman on and yeah. decide that they did a great job. Yeah. But I will say, you know, I've been doing a lot of polling and focus group work recently and with women's white college educated mm -hmm. suburban women, many of whom voted for Trump. And I think part of what the debate, both the Trump Biden debate and even last night's debate did for those women, it <clears throat> it re solidified that feeling that they've been having that they're just exhausted of it. Right. Just yeah, no, no, I agree. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. But I think and that's been showing up in the polls all along. And this just yeah. went, oh, yeah, I remember now. Yeah. I mean, it has been. And yet when you talk to some of these women, they're still like, well, and, and it's interesting because they don't blame and these sort of moderate voters in general, people who are on the fence, they don't blame President Trump for COVID, which I think is perfectly fair. His handling, obviously, is the issue. And so I think part of what we saw was, you know, again, there was not, you know, I guess it's questionable whether or not anything Pence could have said could have made a huge difference. But again, I personally think if he'd had a stronger answer on COVID, it might have helped a little bit because mm -hmm. that is where they are really suffering. And he, the, instead, it was the same talking points that we've heard. And I think the gender dynamics, the way it ended up playing out with the interruptions and, and what have you. And the, and, the, and the way we saw that differential in the way men and women viewed, you know, who won last night, 
again, that is how it's showing up in the polls. And that is how it's showing up and how people talk about their frustration about Trump. I mean, a lot of these women will say things like, you know, I voted for him because I wanted, I thought he would shake things up, but this isn't what I meant. This isn't how I, <laughs> not quite like this, right? This, this right. It, right? Yeah. But, so it's, so, you know, for those people who might have been watching, yes, it is a, it is almost part of a permission structure again, to say, you know what, you, 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 to kind of reinforce your gut that says, Right. Yeah, I don't think I can do that again this time. And I think that's, that's to my mind, it's that very slim margin. And that's what may matter uh, in these debates. I don't know, Casey, did you get the feeling? I sort of looked at it last night and I thought, OK, Pence, vice president has, in a lot of ways, an audience of one. Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, sure. and, yeah. And, and you knew it. And the audience that comes with that audience of one. Yes. Yeah. And that's not a bad thing to go into 2024 with. And I just wondered if this debate for Pence was more about that than about this, than about 2020. Well, I certainly, know. I think there's a lot of speculation yeah. about that for sure. And, you know, it's Mike Pence has clearly made the decision that whatever his future is going to be, it's going to be about what we experienced under Donald Trump. I mean, that's he's become sort of the, the consummate defender of Trump if, if one who wears a more polite, uh, veneer. But yeah, I mean, he was absolutely saying many of the same things that Trump says, defending, you know, his his record on coronavirus, just in a way that is completely different. Um, and that I think is certainly um, the race for 2024 is already well underway in the Republican Party. I mean, there are, I, you know, I could list a half a dozen Republican senators that are thinking more about that and their own posturing for that than they are, you know, about basically anything else uh, right now, because there is kind of this widespread assumption that, you know, the future is not going to be, it's going to be different from what we're experiencing now because things are so, are so dire. Now, you know, we have to issue the caveat that going into the 2016 election, all those same people who now think Trump is going to lose, thought he was going to lose then. Uh, but I do think we're all seeing, you know, it's it's hard to ignore kind of the fundamentals and 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 the the, the realities that we're seeing in the polling um, this time, and and feel like there is not um, a major problem for Trump going into the election. But so, Casey, coming back to 2020 here, I, I haven't looked on Twitter in the last hour, so this may have changed. <laughs> but what is the latest on the next debate and whether that's going to happen? Um, the latest I saw was that Trump is refusing to do it virtually and that they wanted to, the commission came out this morning and said they were going to do it virtually. Trump says, no, Biden's going to do his own separate town hall on ABC. Like what is, what's going on and will we see, do you think we'll see an actual another <laughs> Trump-Biden debate? Yeah, this is a great question and it could be out of date in the next yeah. like, handful of minutes. Right. Uh, so just, just like, uh, 6.35. At this very minute. Right. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, Mike Pence, you know, they felt like they had that he had a good debate last night. And of course, the president woke up this morning and, you know, here we are. And he sort of stepped all over that, whatever that news cycle was going to be about Mike Pence um, to talk about this, which is that he doesn't want to do this debate virtually. As you mentioned, it sounds like Joe Biden has agreed to do a town hall in place of it. They have said, you know, the Trump campaign has suggested well, we should just bump them all by a week. We'll do uh, the the one that was supposed to be next week, the following week, and then we'll add another one the, the, the week right before election day. And the Biden campaign says, no, you know, we agreed to three, you know, on the dates that we said in October, the third one is already one of the latest in the calendar um, in, you know, the history of, of presidential debates, essentially. And obviously candidates get very protective of their time in those final hours and days and, and prepping for a debate takes a lot of time and effort. So saying I'm going to be off the campaign trail for, you know, that last week so that I can prepare for a debate is, is a big wrench to throw at, at anyone. And the reality is, you know, President Trump's White House has been holding events the way they have, and they've had a coronavirus outbreak because of the way they've handled the safety protocols. So Biden's team is saying, well, you know, that's Bad. just, that's yeah. how, that's how this has worked out. These are the ones we've agreed to. We'll be there for the ones that we've agreed to. So um, it seems like at this point, more likely than not, that we will see a debate, not, not next week, but the following week that what will be that third debate. There is some question about the format because Biden's team is saying they want the town hall format that, that Steve Scully was going to host. Um, right. NBC's Kristen Welker is supposed to be hosting that third debate in the format that we saw uh, with Chris Wallace. So I think that's one outstanding question. So Karen, what do you think the Biden campaign should do about this? I mean, should they just 
you know, like Casey said, stick to stick to what was agreed to, yeah. knowing that they have sort of come out of that first debate in a pretty good place. Yeah, hundred percent. Look, I mean, you know, at this point, they have a plan for what has to happen for them over the next three weeks, and it's as Casey pointed out so yeah. so rightly. Coming off, the, I mean, there are, you know, Senator Harris is going to lose several days because of the hearings that, for Amy Coney Barrett. Yeah. Um, so that's one piece. Because remember, at this point, I mean, we are talking about elections are now being, are one, on, it's a game of inches. And it is very targeted to where you've got to go and what voters you've got to be talking to. And yeah. a debate is not necessarily the most effective way to do <laughs> that, right? So between now and election day, they have their plan. They know what they need to do and who they need to be talking to. And a debate is not necessarily, that's part of that plan, but a deviation, particularly the closer you get to election day, is not something that you want to have to factor in if you don't have to, right? It's one thing if, right. you know, natural disaster or something should happen. So, you know, to my mind, I think they should absolutely stick to their plan and stick to their guns. And I think the idea of, trying to, if, if, you know, it's brilliant. I mean, remember in the primaries in 2015, I guess it was 2016, there was a Republican uh, primary debate that Donald Trump didn't want to participate in. So he went right. to his own event instead. Right. He did counter programming. And, and I so, doing that. Right. So yeah. why not yeah. go, you know, go do yeah. that if you are Vice President Biden. Uh, and again, stay focused on what you need to do to win this race and, and you have maintained your commitment. The last thing I would add is, look, there is not a single reason to believe that President Trump will change his behavior and, and act any more responsibly. So, you know, we we don't know he because we're not getting really much information. Is he still contagious? I mean, is it even say will he still be contagious in in two weeks? We don't know. And so I think it's perfectly reasonable to also say we want to make sure some of those things are in place. I'm frankly yeah. one who believes it's not just about the health and safety of the candidates. It's about everybody else that they come into contact with. Right. Um, so I think those are all very serious, very real conversations to be having. I mean, the fact that yesterday is the last thing I'll say on this going into the debate that the Pence team was still grousing about having the plexiglass, plexiglass. on the stage. I, yeah, I didn't get that. Was obscene. And then, you yeah. know, Karen Pence comes up on stage without her mask. I mean, it's just, it's ridiculous that these are the things we're fighting about. And so I think it's, there's nothing wrong with taking every precaution from a safety perspective, particularly with a president who has been so blatantly irresponsible. So I, uh, we have a bunch of questions I want to go to, but I want to take um, advantage of Casey's expertise on the Hill to ask one other Hill question. Nancy Pelosi came out today and sort of teased that saying that tomorrow, come tomorrow, everybody, because we're going to talk about the 25th Amendment. Um, what's going on there? <laughs> uh, well, we're trying to figure that out, Betsy. Um, <laughs> it, uh, you know, they, they want to talk about uh, the succession and, and the power of the, the presidency. Um, yeah. I, I think that the question that we've been trying to get answered is, you know, what are the political reasons for her to do that? Does it have to do with the fact that there's a lot of clamor from, you know, the base and concern about what might happen and the president continues to refuse to answer this question about a peaceful transfer of power and his doctors also um you know continue to not give us any information really about the actual state's health and um and and what her role that has to play so um stay tuned is what i would say there's i'm not sure that there's a lot that they can do um but she certainly has been um focused on laying the groundwork uh for any scenario um i think you know all of us uh, on the one hand, have you know historically had faith in in our systems and in our in our elections, and that the outcomes will be trusted. Uh -huh. um, but also, we've experienced the last four years, um, you know, a lot of things I don't think any of us ever thought we would see. Uh, and you know, the Canadian Prime Minister today said, "Well, I, you know, we're preparing for all outcomes and contingencies. I think all, everyone across the world is hoping that you know there's a clear outcome yeah. uh, on November third, but it." I think would be, you know, everybody feels like it, it would be malpractice to not at least have some semblance of a plan in the event that something unpredictable happens. Interesting. Okay. Um, let me go to a couple of questions. Um, here's one from a former student of mine, Bilal. Um, he says, uh, do you think that Senator Harris is facing the same or similar attacks that Hillary Clinton faced during her, uh, regarding her abilities as a woman, or at least the attacks that men don't face? Um, and then he says, Trump brought up stamina in 2016. Um, do we see similar attacks on 
prepare us. Karen, what do you think of that? I don't think we're not really seeing stamina, but yes, I mean, yeah. look, these attacks on women and women in politics are not new. I mean, Hillary Clinton, you know, having worked <laughs> for her for yeah. a, a, a quite a, you know, a number of years, I can say, I think as she was sort of the tip of the spear for women in a lot of ways and took a lot of the heat in for, for a lot of women, I don't think you would have a Kamala Harris without a Hillary Clinton and frankly, without a mm -hmm. Barack Obama. Um, but I think, look, it is the, you know, what they are facing and what they are uh, being hit with. This is, you know, not unsimilar to what, I mean, we have a record number of women who were elected in 2018 who are on the ballot uh, in 2020. And no doubt they are facing some of the very same kinds of questions. And there's a lot of great research that's been done on, again, perceptions of women candidates and around leadership, around honest and trustworthiness, around, you know, various issues and sort of, you know, I think one of the things that is so important, I'll end with this, about Senator Harris, I hope people feel this way, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, the more women who are in elected office, the more women who bring their lived experiences to decision-making tables, I think the better that is for all of us. Because right. that is a different kind of lived experience than men. And in this instance, particularly uh, as a woman of color, as the daughter of immigrants, as someone who was raised by a single mother, I mean, I think she brings a lot to the table. Um, you know, and a number of the women senators have, I'm sure Casey's heard them, and really interesting stories about how having been, uh, you know, a, a teacher or having been a nurse or their various backgrounds that they bring to um, their role in Congress. And that I think that's important. And I think better decisions get made. So, yes, it's not new. Uh, it will continue, but I think it helps little by little to change the face of power and to get Americans more comfortable uh, with women uh, in positions of power. There, um, there's a group that you're doing some work with called Vote for Her, mm -hmm. um, and you guys have done some um, internet ads and some other things. Tell us a little bit about that project and sure. what, what you hope to do with that. Sure. So the goal of that, I mean, there were in anticipation that there would be uh, a woman, uh, you know, because uh, Vice President Biden said some time ago that he was going to name a woman. Uh, and then when it became clear uh, that it was going to likely to be a woman of color, a black woman, the idea was to kind of create, um, you know, a, a, a coalition, if you will, of women's organizations and women to support this woman candidate and to help push back on the sexism and the racism. I mean, the fact that, you know, we were having conversations in the Veep stakes about, you know, whether or not Kama was someone who would rub people the wrong way or she was too ambitious, right? I don't remember anybody saying that Paul Ryan was too ambitious. Right, right, right. right. So the idea was, let's push back on some of that. And part of the way we have to do that and part of the way we move women in politics forward, and I think this is true in any industry, we have to call it out. And sometimes you need people who are on the outside, not the candidate themselves, not within the campaign themselves, to call it out and to be able to say, hey, this is happening, this is racist, this is sexist, this is a trope, um, and to be able to you know, do some identification around that. One of the things we just did is we put out a, a video today that showed the 43 times that Mike Pence was interrupting both Susan Page uh, and Senator Harris. And I think it's pretty stark when you realize how many times uh, it really was. So that's the goal is to try to you know, unify women behind this woman and really have her back and lift her up uh, and help make sure that we get the correct information out there about her and break through the, the tropes. And I know, Casey, you've been out front a lot on actually calling out, you know, within the media when you've seen things, um, you know, that are, you know, sexist or misogynist in the world of, of the media happening. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I find it, I find it frustrating, um, frankly. And, yeah. you know, it's, it's, um, I think we're having kind of a broader conversation this year in, in the media. Um, you know, a lot of it is centered on on Black Lives Matter, and I, I don't want to take away from that by any stretch, but the conversation about, you know, what is objectivity? What does it mean to make sure that you're playing, you know, the role that you're supposed to play? And I, you know, I was a, a, a classically trained journalist, I guess is what you would call it. I, I grew up in the AP, right? So that's a yeah. very straightforward- I call that capital A journalist, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and so sometimes, you know, I struggle to find the, 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 the balance that I feel comfortable with on this score, but, you know, I feel like I've experienced it enough and I've, I've watched how, uh, you know, I mean, I've learned from 
many, many people over the course of my career, thankfully many women, but also I've watched men do the job and you know, you try it sometimes when you're young to emulate what they're doing and sort of realize that, you know, mm, there are people that are holding women candidates to a different standard. Um, and you know, I certainly would be frustrated if roles were reversed to be held to that different standard. And so I just feel like we have a responsibility to apply as you know, Karen said, the lived experience that you have and to say, no, you know, this is not, I mean, I, um, my sort of favorite um, example is Sherrod Brown, who I know well and who I cover. And, you know, and I, I have good relationships with people on both sides of the aisle. So this is not a partisan comment, but I really like covering him. He's a lovely person. Um, you know, and people think his gravelly voice and his mussed up hair are cute. And when he was thinking about running for president, there were all these stories saying, oh, his rumpled appearance, like how charming. Can you imagine if a woman ran with a rumpled appearance and, and right. people would write right. about her? I mean, it's just, it's hard to wrap your, your head around. And that's not a knock on him by any stretch, but it, it's just an example where, you know, I feel like, you know, you can look at the positive coverage and the way that men use things to their advantage that, that women don't have now. I also think the point about interrupting that Candy made earlier is a good one. And, you know, we all do have to remember, and, you know, I think many people will apply this in their own professional lives regardless, but especially if they have public facing roles, there are things you have available to you as a woman that as a male candidate, you probably don't. Uh, and we all have to be cognizant of those, of those dynamics as well. But the reality is the system has been built and set up by, you know, people who played by a certain set of rules and had rules for entry um, and rules for you know kicking people out of, of their system. And you know, I just I think we're all kind of going through this this reckoning about what does that mean? What does that look like? How do we make sure that we're um, being, you know, that, that our definition of objective and fair and unbiased is something that's also inclusive. Yeah. Um, everyone. Um, so Candy, I put you in that capital J journalist category, but as you have said, it can now sort of watch from afar of coverage, right? What do you think in terms of um, media coverage out there that may be sexist or unfair um, and the notion of kind of calling that out? Well, obviously, I also grew up in the AP. Yeah, so it's, yeah. it's um, listen, there's a long way to go. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, mm -hmm. and you can see things uh, like I, I think, and not just in politics, in media. Mm -hmm. in who's yeah. on the air, who's not yeah. on the air, who's, uh, I mean, in, in, and not just, you, you know, everywhere in the corporate boardrooms, in the whatever, this is a, this is a long haul fight. I think the good thing is I loved last night and I was like, so off on this, how many men decided that Pence was mansplaining. Right. I did. You know, they say, they love that word. Right. I thought, OK, I'm kind of like, you know, Senator Harris. I don't want men telling me what mansplaining is. Uh, <laughs> I mean, mansplaining, mansplaining, mansplaining. Right. <laughs> yeah. I mean, a man mansplaining what mansplaining is. And I actually didn't see that. For, I mean, I I didn't catch that. I'm sure someone uh -huh. felt that I, I just didn't. I thought this is just go out there and keep talking. You know, I just saw like a debate. Uh, strategy. I didn't see mansplaining exactly. I don't. I don't know what the senator thought about it. But so I. I think the idea that that we're now, you know, clicking on light bulbs everywhere, right? Uh -huh. That we're saying when you hear this, this is code for that. I think that's progress. But it's gonna, you know, it takes a while, and it takes a while in politics, and it takes a while in journalism, and it takes a while in the corporate boardroom. And I. Yeah. I wish it would happen tomorrow. You know. Oh, Lord, I wish it would happen before I died. But I <laughs> so um, Baby, we're getting there. Baby, yes, we're getting there. Um, getting there. Let's see, here's a question from Isabel. Um, are there areas in Senator Harris's debate performance in which you feel that she could have responded better? Um, let me ask Candy and Casey that. Karen, you don't count because you have on your jersey. <laughs> I, I thought her response to um, have you had a conversation, I thought both of their responses, by the way, but I thought her response, because this was, I think, most important for her to the yeah. question of have you had conversations with Joe Biden about a transfer of power, if anything should happen and how yeah. that would work and what you would think, you know, OK, she went with her bio and that's fine. But I wanted a more direct, you know, look, we we get it. He's. You know, I, I'm sure they don't want to. It reminded me a little bit of when Bob Dole ran, and every he he had a birthday that came up, and he's young compared to what's going on now. <laughs> but 
um, every time that we'd go someplace, they'd bring out a birthday cake. And oh. his, his press secretary would jump in front of it so they couldn't <laughs> get shots of it. So this sort of reminds me of it. So I'm sure they don't want to talk about how old Joe Biden is. I don't think it matters at this point. I think it's that Joe Biden isn't Donald Trump. I think that's his main selling point at this point. And so I, I think, you know, she should have been stronger on that. But again, I think she was fine overall getting across the point that she's ready to move into that number two slot. Mm -hmm. Casey, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, the one thing that stuck out to me was, um, although, you know, it wasn't a question from the moderator, so in some ways it's a little bit unfair, but the um, core packing question, uh, you know, yeah. she was asked, uh, yeah. would you add justice as the court? And she didn't answer that question. Um, obviously, there were plenty of examples of Mike Pence completely ignoring Susan Page's questions and just, you know, answering different uh, queries uh, than, than the ones that were put to him. Which was the irony of, of him, you know, hitting back at her for that when he had spent the entire debate. Right. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's like a little bit. And and I think, I don't know if it was Karen or Candy who mentioned that, I mean, this is not, that's the strategy, right? I mean, it's, we can knock them for it, but that they go in there wanting to present a certain set of things. And so it, it is what it is. But I mean, Joe Biden today was struggling and essentially said, you'll know my answer on court packing after election day, which is kind of a confusing thing for any candidate to say when you're, you know, you're running for president. So I think, I mean, that's, that's one of the very few, um, mm -hmm. you know, places where we're talking about the divisions in the Dem within the Democratic Party. I mean, it becomes so much about the referendum on on Trump that some of those, you know, divisions and, and the Biden campaign has done a very a very good job of papering over them as well um, and getting progressives on board. Um, but they're right there under the surface, and this is one of the few topics that has like broken through that. I would say. So Karen, is there anything that you're willing to tell us that you think she could have done better? Um, sure. Uh, okay. There was a, I mean, look, I, the interesting thing about the question of court packing that I will say, yeah. or expanding the court, yeah. I, should do my, I should do my job, <laughs> um, was, you know, Vice President Pence is the one who posed the question and then it kind of came as a question. And so at first when she didn't answer, I thought, yeah, don't answer his question. You don't have to take that from him. But then obviously we sort of, I, I get why, uh, you know, I wish that we would just answer the question. I do think it's yeah. one that no need to let that become a side issue at this point, frankly. But I understand why, because we know that that's where conservatives want to take it instead of staying focused on, okay, people are voting. Why are we doing this? Mm -hmm. I would have liked to hear her say a little bit more about her. And it was an interesting exchange Um about her own record as DA and, you know, mm -hmm. Pence tried to throw at her, her record um, and, and, you know, the record of, you know, sort of Trump and Pence on criminal justice reform, which many of us who are African-American kind of roll our eyes at because it's really, you know, if they really cared about the issue, they could make McConnell take up the Justice and Policing Act right now. And I bet you that would get a lot of people off the streets uh, protesting. However, I thought she could have given a slight, a stronger answer um, because it is one of the issues, as Casey probably knows so well, from the primary where she did, there really wasn't a fulsome conversation about her role as uh, both DA and attorney general. I think she did a, you know, last night she tried to weave that into a question about, you know, I'm not going to be lectured to uh, by Vice President Biden on these. And she talked to, and she tried to tick through a bit of what her record was. Yeah, but I think there was a specific charge I would have liked to have heard her just push back on because, again, is it is a misinformation that's been out there since the primary. But I sort of took that as one of those moments that she just decided, OK, you know what, I'm going to just I'll just take that hit because I got to get the bigger message out in the time that I have left. Right. Um, here's another question for you, Karen. Um, fast forwarding to 2024. Um, which women do you think will be seeing on the debate stage, presidential, vice presidential, or otherwise, sort of the rising stars that are out there for um, 2024? Um, well, of course, as a Democrat, I have to say that since Kamala Harris will likely be running, uh, on the <laughs> there won't be any on the Democratic side challenging her. It'll be interesting to see if will there be any Republican women uh, <laughs> who, are, who are running. Um, look, I think the you know rising stars in our party. There are are so many. I mean, Stacey Abrams. I think we still. I know that we'll see her running for president. I think her intention is to run for governor um, yeah. in in Georgia. But she is certainly someone to to keep an eye on. 
Um, there are a number of women in the House uh, who I think we, you know, got to know a bit through the VP primary, pro you know, the sort of the VP stakes process that I think are interesting and we ought to keep an eye on. Tish James, I have to, full disclosure, she happens to be my cousin. Um, she is the attorney general of the state of New York, which is for women, that is one of, you know, that sort of law and order credential is an important credential on the pathway to running for governor. Right. Um, and so I think she's definitely someone to keep an eye on. Um, and again, I'm just encouraged by the fact that we have so many more women, this trend, you know, in 2018 and 2020 of more women running. I just think it's good for the country to have, you know, more diversity and more diverse voices and faces putting themselves out there and willing to run for office because it's, you know, somebody was trying to describe it as, you know, it's like, we're going to hang you up by your, you know, fingernails or something. It's just like mm -hmm. the, worst, the mm -hmm. hardest, worst thing in the world. But I always admire people who are, are willing to do it. And I was, you know, part of why I enjoy helping good people win. Casey, what about you as you cover Congress? Do you see, who do you see out there as potential um, candidates, I guess, for either party? Um, female running in either 2024 or maybe 2028, like Karen says. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean, well, I mean, obviously I would have put Harris uh, on yeah. the list. She's somebody that um, that really sticks out. Um, honestly, uh, one person I'm watching on the Republican side is Liz Cheney. Uh -huh. I think um, she has a very long future um, in the Republican Party. I think um, she, I don't know if she's going to run for president. I Part of me thinks she might want to do Speaker of the Speaker, House yeah. someday. Um, instead, uh, but I um, I find her to be very impressive, and she um, has you know shown no fear in kind of staking out a position that's different from the Trump camp um, at a time when it is difficult to do that. Uh, you know, and, and I'm interested to see how how that that pays off um, or doesn't pay off. Yeah. Um Let's see, our time is coming to an end here. I want to let folks know of some um, two more upcoming Women on Wednesdays that we have uh, over the next uh, two weeks. Um, next Wednesday, we are going to have a discussion on gender and generation, so exploring um, younger women in politics and the 50 plus women in politics with um, Nancy Leamon from the AARP and Sarah Guillermo from Ignite and Melissa Beckman, who is a political science professor at uh, Washington College. So they will be here for that. And then the following week, we're going to do um, a discussion about uh, Republican women that are running in 2020. We just had folks from Emily's List last week. So we're going to have uh, two Republican um, organizations that are working to elect uh, women in politics, Julie Conway from ViewPack and Rebecca Schuler from uh, Winning for Women. So uh, we're looking forward to having them here uh, to discuss everything. And we hope you will join us for um, those discussions as well. Uh, but I want to thank Candy and Casey and Karen so much for sharing your expertise with us tonight. We thank really you. It. Thank you. Thank you for having us. This was Thank for joining yeah. us. It's an honor to be with you guys. Okay. Take care, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye.